Okay. Okay, thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Okay, so I'm probably going to spend the next 10 or 12 minutes telling you something you already know, which is that the Southern Ocean aerosol system is pristine. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting to, to try and quantify how pristine and uh, what that means for how that system behaves. And also to question how we know it's pristine, um, whether we can actually observe the fact that the Southern Ocean aerosol system is pristine. So this is a model view of uh, how pristine the Southern Ocean aerosol system is. And to be honest, I don't know how we would do the same uh, from observations. And I think it's a real challenge to work out how we can learn from observations about how pristine the environments are that we're, we're looking at. So that takes me to my first slide and to really define what I mean by pristine. So the word pristine means uh, unaltered from its original state. And I, th I think we heavily misuse this word uh, in, in atmospheric science because people tend to use the word pristine to mean clean. Uh, and many parts of the atmosphere are clean. It's probably clean in San Francisco after heavy rain. But that doesn't mean that that aerosol system is pristine in the sense of behaving like it did in its unaltered state, which I take to mean the pre-industrial. Okay, so this is what we're trying to get at, is what, where can we find parts of the planet which are behaving and looking like they did in the pre-industrial? And that will not be the same as finding regions of the atmosphere that are just transiently clean because of some removal process. Okay, so I think um, efforts to go down to the Southern Ocean and measure that aerosol system and its behavior are well motivated by trying to understand what the pre-industrial atmosphere was like. So the, the reason we want to know about so much now about the pristine atmosphere is because we realize it's an important baseline from which we calculate radiative forcings. And this is really important for the aerosol system because the aerosol system is very sensitive at very low aerosol concentrations. So a lot of the change in the aerosol properties probably happened quite soon after we started emitting anthropogenic aerosol. So top right there is the results from our paper last year where we showed that um, about 45 to 50% of the uncertainty in the indirect forcing globally was because of natural aerosol emissions. And that's because the pristine pre-industrial aerosol state uh, is very sensitively controlling the net change from the pre-industrial to the present day. Uh, so what we want to do then is find parts of the atmosphere that are as close as possible to their pre-industrial state so we can go to these regions of the world and start observing and understanding them as the starting point for our forcing calculations. So the question in my talk is then how pristine is the Southern Ocean aerosol system? What controls that aerosol state and, and how have these controls perhaps changed since the, the pre-industrial, if at all? So in other words, how good an analog is the Southern Ocean for the pre-industrial? If we went there, would we be observing pre-industrial? And I don't know how you do that from observations, but I do know how you can do it with a model. So this is a, an animation showing not the aerosol state, but the change in the aerosol state from the pre-industrial to the present day. Um, and we're showing here cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and you're looking at the percentage change in CCN between the pre-industrial and the present day. So the reason we're able to get what looks like a meteorological sort of uh, flow field for that is because we're using analyzed meteorology. So we're using identical meteorology in the pre-industrial and present day and doing, just doing two simple equivalent runs, one with present day emissions and one with pre-industrial emissions. And what you're seeing there is the day-by-day -day variations in how non-pristine the planet is. So of course the whole northern hemisphere is we chose brown because it's dirty. Uh, it's polluted. And you can see that most of the southern hemisphere is fairly clean, but not all the time. So as you see, if we come now, we're in May, uh, we come into southern hemisphere winter, you can see that the southern ocean becomes briefly not quite so pristine by this definition. Um, so this is a percentage change in CCN. There are also these weird changes in the northern hemisphere because of changes in forest fires. But you see as we come back round to southern hemisphere summer again that it's much more uh, pristine by this definition in terms of the change of, of CCN. But there was a period when the Southern Ocean there uh, for, for, in the winter season was not that pristine by this definition. So what's going on? I put that in just in case that animation didn't work. Okay, so one thing you can do then with analyzed meteorology and all you're changing is the emissions is, is you can work out how many days you have pristine aerosol conditions. So how many days is a particular grid cell of that model have CCN that's within, let's say, 20%. And you can arbitrarily set that percentage, and these maps kind of pulse up and down as you change your um, threshold for saying they're pristine. Um, but we've used 20%, which is about the uncertainty on a CCN measurement. 
Um, so these four months here, January, April, July, and October, so you can see that's what I showed in the previous slide, that January, the Southern Hemisphere summer, is much more pristine. So we have almost all days in the Southern Ocean are pristine by that definition. As you move through April, you start to lose some of those pristine days, and then getting into July and October, you see you only have uh, a few pristine days per month, uh, in the, even in the Southern Ocean. So that's by 20% definition, so if in terms of observing aerosol processes you're happy with 50%, then we could draw another map and you would maybe find more regions that were pristine. So I don't know what the, from, from simply counting CCN, I don't know what the, how we should sort of draw the line and say this is pristine enough. Um, so another way of doing this is to look at the processes that are controlling that aerosol and make sure that we're observing not just the same state as the pre-industrial, but the same behavior as well. Okay, so that's the second thing we've we've tried to do. Um, so before I go on to looking at the processes, this just shows now pristine regions from that previous map, but this time masking out regions where the cloud fraction, the long-term cloud fraction, is, is more than one-third. So this is identifying where you have pristine regions that are cloudy. Okay? So all the world's pristine, rather persistently cloudy regions are in the southern uh, hemisphere, and most of them are in, uh, are in the southern ocean. So it's a good place to go for pristine cloudy regions by that definition. Okay, so now we want to not just look at the, how pristine it is in terms of um, the aerosol state, you know, how many particles you have or what the mass is, but it also in terms of the processes that are controlling that aerosol. So that's what's shown here. This is a long story, but I'll cut it very short to say that we've done a very large perturbed parameter ensemble from this global aerosol model, and then to pick out the parameters that are controlling the sensitivity of the CCN to the perturbations in these parameters. So I've shown three things there that are important for the Southern Ocean. Uh, this is sea spray on the left. DMS emissions in the middle, and then Aitken mode width is one of these parameters in the model that you have to make a decision about how you model it. And what you're looking at is a sigma of the standard deviation of CCN divided by the mean from this big perturbed parameter ensemble. So you can see where sea spray emissions are controlling the, the, the uncertainty or the sensitivity, if you like, uh, of the CCN. Uh, and then DMS is mostly over the Antarctic coast and in the deep southern ocean. Okay, so they, they are controlling CCN in different places, which is, is not a surprise. Uh, so what we want to do now is to compare that with the pre-industrial. So we can run the exact same doing thing, do a large perturbed parameter ensemble for the pre-industrial, and then we can compare which processes are sensitive in the pre-industrial and, and, and the present day. So let's look at the present day um, sort of average sensitivities, which I'm about to compare with the, with the pre-industrial. So to make sense of all this, you don't need to look in every single grid box. We've done a cluster analysis to find regions of similar sensitivity. So the Southern Ocean comes out from that cluster analysis as being a region of similar sensitivities. The same sorts of things are controlling CCN throughout that entire purple zone of the Southern Ocean and the entire blue zone of the Antarctic coast and into Antarctica. And those processes from that purple zone, the Southern Ocean, or what you're calling the Southern Ocean, uh, are these. These are the ones in our model, when you perturb them, CCN responds the most. So this is the fraction of the uncertainty, if you like. Dry deposition, DMS emissions in the summer, disappears in the winter, comes back again in the next summer. Sea spray comes up in the winter, not so strong in the summer, and then some um, properties of the particles themselves. All right, so now we're going to compare that with the pre-industrial. So now what we've got is a scatter plot of the pre-industrial sensitivities versus the present day. So if the, if, the, if the atmosphere behaved exactly the same as it did pre-industrial and present day, this would be a one-to-one -one correlation. And you can see it is mostly a one-to-one -one correlation, except the natural emissions are less important in the present day than, the, than they were in the pre-industrial. So in terms of behavior, the Southern Ocean has changed a little bit since pre-industrial. That's what it's telling us. Just to put that in context, if I compare that with the Eastern Atlantic, you can see all the natural processes have completely disappeared as being important in the present day uh, and have been replaced by anthropogenic um, process, emissions. So the Eastern Atlantic looks nothing like it did in pre-industrial, where the Southern Ocean looks rather much like it did in the pre-industrial. And again, you see the same thing if you step through the months. Summer looks very, very pristine in terms of behavior, and as you come into the winter months, you start to see departures, and it doesn't behave quite like it did in the, in the pre-industrial. Okay, so that's how the system behaves, but the question that 
people then often put to us is, well, that, does that mean that DMS is simply, is, is the entire aerosol system just controlled by these sort of biological processes, the DMS, etc.? And you actually can't answer that question from those sorts of simulations. So what I'm doing here is going back to a paper that was published in 2008 um, to answer that question. What is controlling the seasonal cycle of, of CCN in the Southern Ocean? This is the, the question that keeps coming up. So these are measurements at Cape Grim. Black line is the measurements, the red line is our full model. And you see that our model captures the seasonal cycle very well in CCN concentrations. And if we switch off DMS, you can see that we don't have a seasonal cycle. So this seems to confirm our prejudice that the Southern Ocean seasonal cycle is caused by DMS, okay? Because you don't get a seasonal cycle when you remove it. Unfortunately, if you go to another latitude, 45 to 60, uh, and remove the DMS, you still do have a seasonal cycle. Okay, um, that's that blue line here. So you, you still have a seasonal cycle without a biological control. So what's controlling the seasonal cycle in the southern hemisphere if it's not DMS? So to find the answer to that, what you can do is just shut off all nucleation in the free troposphere. That's these two stars here. That completely flattens the seasonal cycle. So what this means is that actually 60% of the seasonal cycle in CCN is not driven by DMS. It's just driven by a basic property of the free troposphere, the dynamics, the production of particles, their transport into the marine boundary layer, not driven necessarily by the, uh, the DMS. So I think that's the only way to do these sorts of experiments, on-off type experiments, and see what you're left with when you, um, when you don't have DMS. So that was a surprise to us, and I, I think it's still a surprise to others. They, they think that all of that seasonal cycle is driven by, by DMS. So what you find then that the, the source of the aerosol in the, in the southern ocean is you have to remember that much of it is coming from this free tropospheric. Up, this is um, pressure here, going up to the upper troposphere, and then su southern South Pole, North Pole. You've got this huge resource of um, particle concentration in the free troposphere, which is eventually being entrained into the boundary layer. And that is very hard to perturb, okay? So it's not all controlled by DMS. It's partly the sort of pulsing of the, the free tropospheric particle concentration and coming into the Southern Ocean. Okay, so to conclude then, so I've shown that the aerosol system in the Southern Ocean is pristine not just in one way, but two. It's pristine in terms of its state. It looks like it did in the uh, 1750s. And it's also pristine in terms of its behavior, and it is sensitive in the same way to the parameters that we perturbed. Okay? And there's a seasonal cycle in pristineness. It's more pristine in the southern hemisphere summer. Um, and the seasonal amplitude of the, of the CCN is not entirely driven by biological processes. So just because it's pristine doesn't mean we can jump to the conclusion that it's all driven by biological emissions. And then finally, just to note that it's, although we want to go maybe to the Southern Ocean to learn about the baseline for pre-industrial aerosol, this doesn't mean it's a good analog for the Northern Hemisphere. And that's something you can ask me about uh, afterwards. Okay, thank you. They say again, they were not, or? Higher in the summer than the winter. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I'm showing. It's more, it's more pristine, it's less, it's less polluted, but the, uh, yeah, you're using the definition pristine to mean clean again, I think. Pristine means not like the pre, means like the pre-industrial. Okay, not clean. High particle concentrations can still be pristine. Yeah. Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. You get a little. You get a little bit of, uh, of anthropogenic uh, organic uh, soa down there, and that changes the size distribution slightly, which suppresses the role of uh, sea spray in controlling it. Yeah, you're right. All right, one more, but it's quick.